morning, and welcome to week nine, I think, of the Broadway broadcast. I'm Taylor. And I'm Logan. And thank you to Donna Logan for helping us remember who we are and adding to our wonderful set. If you are interested in, in sending us something to add to our weekly sets, we welcome those gifts, and uh, we will also give you a shout out every week. But this week's announcements, we start out with, we have a deacon ordination service tonight. It will be in the new sanctuary at six o'clock. Come be a part of that with us. It's a special night for two special young men in our church and uh, come rally around them and show them how much we love them. Parents, Wednesday night, we are taking our youth to Nazareth Baptist Church right down the road for a back to school bash. Our students will be leading worship. We're just gonna join with them in a night of worship. Um, and not diving in the word um, we are leaving from the youth room at 6 30. we will be traveling over um, and then coming right back we will be back by about 8 15. service will start about 7 8 15 8 30 is when we'll be back if your student can drive and it is okay with you um, they can drive over to nazareth to help us make sure we can get everybody over there in one trip wonderful now, if you are looking for a class to be a part of, maybe something during the week, a Bible study, Greg Chapman is starting one of those. It is a purpose-driven life curriculum, and it will be done virtually through Zoom, through the Realm app. It will not cost anything to do the virtual side of it. Uh, but if you have any questions, contact Greg or call the office. That class begins September the 5th. Yeah. Also, Operation Christmas Child at Walk Through Bethlehem uh, all that stuff is still on the back table. Don't forget the OCC gifts um, and ornaments. Please pick up the rest of those ornaments. Make sure we get those gifts so that Operation Christmas Child can be a success this year. And again, if you haven't signed up to be part of Walk Through Bethlehem, please do so. We would love, love, love to have all everybody in our church um, contributing to that this without year. Without a doubt, without a doubt. Now, our last one for uh, this week will be Children's Choir. If you have a child that would like to or that uh, is interested, uh, we have two sections of children's choir. That is three through K, and that is taught by Paige Williamson on Wednesday night. And then the, the Wednesday after Labor Day, that would be the 7th of September. That Wednesday night, we will be in children's choir for first grade through sixth grade, and that will be taught by Hannah Seymour. If, uh, if your child, again, is interested in that, drop them off if you have any questions. Feel free to call me during the week. And uh, we're already beginning Christmas music, so get out the jingle bells and get them excited. Yeah, and last but not least, if you haven't picked up a bulletin outside, please do so. And if you're a first-time visitor with us, within that bulletin, you'll find a Connect card. Um, please fill that Connect card out, tear it out, um, and go hand it inside one of our offer boxes or come and hand it to me and Taylor. We would love to talk to you, love to get to know you, answer any questions that you may have, pray with you if you need it. Um, and other than that, that wraps up this week's edition of the Broadway Broadcast. I hate to ruin your day. Two things to say about that video. One, my mistake, is that the deacon ordination service is not in this building tonight. It is in the Faith Chapel at 6 o'clock. So be here for that in the Faith Chapel. If you come in here, it's going to be a little lonely. Second thing, if you placed a wager last week, maybe lose rest by lunch kind of thing on whether or not Logan says absolutely, you're buying lunch because he did not. And it was on purpose. Yeah. He finished that video. He looked at me and he said, high five. I didn't say absolutely. It's like, yeah, I'm proud of you, buddy. <laughs> proud of you. Welcome to Broadway, where we are happy to have you, not just here to worship with us, but here is family. Uh, we stand up. We do stand up and we smile because we are recipients of grace and mercy that we do not deserve. That brings joy to our life. And when we join, as scripture says, as believers in the house of the Lord, we will find joy. So join us. Lord today and we won't be 
Both services contain a song that in the last probably month or so I've been asked. The first service, we sang, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And somebody came up to me and asked a question about a lyric. And about a month ago, someone came up to me and asked a question about this next song. And it is not a new song by any means. Matter of fact, as Chase Parker pointed out, six years from now, I will have been out of school 20 years. And um, this song came out when I was in school. But it's called Cornerstone, and the lyric that came up in question was um, about the anchor. Uh, we, we see imagery here of construction, and we know that a cornerstone is something that, if it's not in the right place, the, the structure, the foundation of the building is, the integrity of the building is in question. It can't, it can't be a solid building without that one thing. And back in the day, that's how that one stone was put in place, or the remainder of the building could be solid. But then we kind of flip imagery to my anchor holds within the veil. Well, and I didn't really have an answer for this person. And so I went back and started looking through Scripture because typically, well, not typically, every time we sing a song, it's going to be rooted in Scripture. It's going to be backed by something in Scripture. So I found the answer to this, and it was well worth sharing with y'all. So Hebrews 6 now, keep in mind, the lyric is, my anchor holds within the veil. For those who have not spent any time on a boat, the anchor is kind of a critical part. If not, you float aimlessly. But Hebrews 6, 19 and 20 says, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters the veil, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So, meaning the place where Jesus went, the holiest of holy, the place where we cannot possibly fathom going because we are flawed, is the place where our hope is found 
and our life is staked. And that as encouragement to you, because whatever you're coming in the building with, we constantly get an opportunity to kind of just go by the wayside. We constantly have the opportunity and, and option to make this, to make Christ an option. And as our anchor is held within that veil, the place that we cannot go to without him, that being the one constant that keeps us forward. So let that be a different way of thinking as we sing this song. Wherever you're coming in with, whatever you're coming in with, let this meet you where you're at. As scripture says, it will not come back void and he will use it for his glory.
Church, would you pray with me? Father, we love you. Thank you for the name that's above every other name. Thank you for the incredible, immeasurable grace that you give us that's found through Christ and through Christ alone. Father, I pray this morning as we take some time, we take a few moments out of our weeks and out of um, our weekend, Father, to come into your house, to lift your name up. Father, I pray that your word would encourage us, that your word would embolden us, and God, that your word would fill us up with the knowledge and the truth of your message, that you came to, to save the lost, that you came to save sinners so that we could one day reign with you and obtain your righteousness. Father, I pray that these next few moments that your word would go forth. And Father, you, you promised that it won't return void. So Father, I pray it would encourage us this morning to share the gospel better. And Father, I pray that if somebody here has not placed their faith in you this morning, that they would. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the empty tomb. And thank you for the time that we have together this morning. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Children's Church, you can be dismissed at this time, and you can have a seat. And good morning. You are visiting with us this morning. We are so delighted to welcome you. Thank you for coming this way this morning. Uh, we do have a little item of business we need to take care of before we get into our message time this morning. Inside your bulletin, you should have a copy of this year's budget, proposed budget. Uh, it was presented Wednesday night. Not only should you find a copy of the budget, uh, but there also should be a ballot inside of your uh, morning worship folder. And uh, I'd ask you to take the budget out and look it over right quick. And in just a second or two, we're going to ask you to cast your vote to either accept that or reject it. Uh, our policy is that it is presented on Wednesday night. It was this past Wednesday night, a special called business meeting, and uh, this morning we bring it to you uh, without any discussion. All of our discussion was taking place uh, this past Wednesday night, but this morning we're going to ask you just to cast your ballot either for this budget or against, and uh, we will take those ballots up even now. So if you have your balance, anybody need anything to write with? You have something to mark your ballot with? Anybody need anything? Anybody that does not have a ballot? We do ask that only our members uh, vote on this. Uh, but if you need a ballot, we would love to get one to you, either a ballot or something to mark your ballot with. Anybody need anything? We're going to ask that you mark your ballot at this time, and we're going to ask this section to pass this way and this section to pass that way, and someone will be in that center aisle over there. And uh, same thing over here, if y'all will pass them this way and this section pass that way. You folks in the back, I don't know what to think about you. All the way back there, man alive. Can't tell who anybody is back there. But I'm glad we had a back row. Y'all wouldn't have no words to sit, would you? <laughs> While you're marking your ballots and we're taking those up, I uh, ask that you pray for Theo and his family. Uh, their funeral for his mother uh, will be this afternoon, 2 o'clock, up at the funeral home. And uh, she had visited with our church for a period of time uh, over the years, but uh, we are sad at her going home, but we know exactly where she has gone. She has gone home. For years, she was a missionary, helping people to learn about Jesus, and now she has uh, gone to be with the Lord Jesus Christ uh, herself. So, uh, Anybody else need anything? You got a ballot, you voted. Anybody that has not had their ballot taken up? If you'll hold it up high where they can see it, you'll have to wave at them. If you're going to be shy, your ballot won't get counted. All right. Well, thank you very much for helping us take care of that item of business. Well, some weeks ago, we started a series of sermons that were entitling the least of these. And uh, this morning, we want to continue with that. The time There will be a time in your life when you will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ 
and you will actually hear him say these words. The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. He's talking about what you did, not what you thought about doing, not what you prayed about doing, not what you even talked about doing in one of your small groups or maybe within your family, but he's, going to, he's talking about what you actually did. Jesus said, whatever you did to the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. And the other side of that coin is equally true. He said he will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do, for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. So it's very important what we do for people around us, because what we do for people around us, it is as though we are doing for the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And you need to be aware that whenever you pass opportunities by, you are passing up an opportunity to do something for the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are talking about the least of these. And this morning, I want to talk to you about a man by the name of David. Now, if you know David, you are somewhat puzzled by finding David on a list of the least of these. How in the world can David be on a list when you're talking about the least of these? In the book of Acts, when we read about David, we see that he is referred to as a man after God's own heart. Look at the last part of that verse. He will do everything I want him to do. When you turn to 1 Samuel, you find out about David that in chapter 23, that David and his men went to Keilah and they slaughtered the Philistines. They took all of their livestock and they rescued the people of Keilah. Now, notice that he is not just a man who led people into battle. He was a mighty man, a mighty warrior, and he slaughtered the Philistines. The Philistines were a nuisance in the life of David, but the Bible tells us that he was victorious. He was a mighty man of war. If he's a mighty man of war, a man after God's own heart, how in the world does he ever show up on the list of the least of these? Well, not only that, but if you ever read the book of Kings, and by the way, you do read the books of Kings, don't you? This is where you say, yes, preacher. Nobody's saying yes, preacher. Okay, the next time you start reading the books of Kings, one of the things that you'll find is that many of the kings are compared to David. They're either compared as being a man who was like David, or they, they, sometimes they're compared as not being anything like David at all. But notice, if you would, how Josiah is referred to. He was eight years old when he became king. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he walked in all the ways of his father, David. But notice that last little tag on that line. Not turning aside to the right or to the left. He walked a straight, narrow path just like his father, David, had done. One last illustration. There was a guy by the name of Nabal in the Old Testament. And Nabal was a fairly wealthy rancher. He raised sheep and all kind of animals. And David sort of kept his men out close to where Nabal was. Now, he didn't really offer protection to Nabal, but it's sort of like driving down the interstate and you see this blue light off in the distance. You know as you get closer, whatever speed you're traveling, you better look at it very closely because you're about to pass where they check your speed. And suddenly you really get very careful about how you drive. Well, David was very much the same way. If his men were camped out anywhere close to you, you always kept a very close eye on how you behaved yourself. 
No one would mess with Nabal as long as David and his men were camped close by. Well, there came a time in Nabal's life where he really insulted David. I mean, tremendously insulted him. And David was going to go and just take care of the situation. A man insult David. But Abigail intervened. She came to David and notice what Abigail said to David. The Lord will surely reward you with a lasting dynasty. For you are fighting the Lord's battle. And you have done no wrong throughout your entire life. Man, you wouldn't you love for somebody to say that kind of stuff about you? Well, if we have all this stuff pointing to the greatness of who David was, how in the world can we put him on a list when we start talking about the least of these? Well, I want you to look, if you have your listening guide with you there this morning, because you see that David wasn't always the guy that was held in the highest of esteem. Look with me, would, 1 Samuel chapter 16, and let's look at verse number 1. The Bible says, the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil, and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse. Everybody say Jesse. Now, I want you to notice how many times this passage refers to Jesse. I am specifically sending you to Jesse. Uh, in, uh, I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen uh, one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said to God, how can I go? Saul will hear about it, and he will kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Verse number three, invite Jesse. Make sure that Jesse is a part of this sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord told him to do, and when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled. Now notice, those who are official welcoming party, they're scared to death that Samuel has come to see them. And notice the question that they ask him. Do you come in peace? Now, that'd be kind of like Billy Graham showing up in your neighborhood and you saying to him, do you come in peace? Well, it was a dangerous thing to have the man of God show up in your town because he may be bringing good news or he could be there because there is sin in the camp and you really want to know why he's coming to you. If you've ever read the book of uh, Joshua, you know there's a story in there about a man by the name of Achan. And Achan had taken some things that really belonged to the Lord, and he had hid them away. He stole them, and he hid them. And because of what he did, the Bible says that all of Israel had this sin weighing upon their heart. And so the God spoke to them and said, you've got sin in the camp, you have to deal with it. Well, the people of Israel never knew why when a man like Samuel showed up, whether he was coming with good news or with bad news. Notice, if you would, how the contemporary English version translates this. They're asking him, is this a friendly visit or have you come for some other reason? Now, they're scared to death. The Bible says they are trembling with fear. Well, Samuel gives them assurance that he is there in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord, he says. Concentrate, consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse. Now, we're not surprised to see his name. We've already seen it several times. But this time, he specifically consecrate Jesse and his sons, and he invites them. Jesse, make sure you and all of your boys come to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab, and he thought, surely the, uh, surely the Lord's anointed stands before me here. Now, in Sand Mountain language, Basically, what this is saying is Samuel 
was really impressed. Did any of y'all come to the funeral of Joe Hall? Joe Hall, son, uh, grandson-in-law, they got married just a few months ago. That guy, I want to tell you, he was, I think he said he was 6'7", and I don't know how big around he was, but he was a beast of a man. Matter of fact, everybody I saw that I knew at the, the funeral, I told them, I said, now this is my new best friend. And I, I was indicating that they wanted to get rough with me. I had some backup there. Matter of fact, I had introduced him so many times as my new best friend. When uh, we were finished with the funeral, I was saying bye to everybody. I walked up to him, and he looked at me, and he says, my new little buddy. Well, that's the way Samuel thought about Eliab. He thought, man, look at this guy. He's big, he's tall. And Samuel himself thought, surely this is the reason God has sent me to this place. But that was not to be it. The Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Can I just say something to you very earnestly and very honestly? Folks, for those of you who, who are living to impress other people, that's not going to get you very far in this life. What's really going to matter in your life over the long haul is whether you're living to impress God. Now, I tell you that because we live in a culture that really teaches us to live to impress other people. We try to impress them with the clothes that we wear, the cars that we drive, the houses that we build, all kinds of things that we really try to impress other people about. But folks, I want to tell you, not much of that stuff impresses God. It's the little things that we do for other people in showing love. And you may not be noticed by anybody, but those are the things that impress God. God doesn't look at all these things we do to impress other people. God is always looking as what's going on in your heart. Well, Eliab, he didn't impress any, he didn't, he impressed Samuel, but he didn't impress God. So they brought another son in front. Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse had Shammah pass by. But Samuel said, no, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven sons, and each one passed before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. And then he asked Jesse, is this all the sons you have? I mean, God sent me here to find Jesse and to anoint someone of this family to be king. Is this it? This is all you have? And notice what uh, Samuel replies, uh, Jesse replies, no, we've still got the youngest, but he's out tending sheep. He's not important enough that we would even bring him to the sacrifice. Can I tell you really what he's saying? There's one more son, but he's, he's just the least of these. We didn't even think it was important enough that he would come to the sacrifice of the Lord. And Samuel said, well, you send for him, you send for him, because we're not going to sit down until he arrives. Now, I don't know how many of you were listening last Sunday, but when we talked about Gideon, one of the things I tried to point out about Gideon's life is how patient God is. And I need to remind you today that God is patient with you. God says, I've got something I want you to do. And by the way, many times that is something that 
really only you can do. It doesn't take a whole lot to do what God wants you to do. Just simply trust God in what he's leading you to do. And as you trust him, God will do incredible things all around you. God has a plan for your life. And it's a plan for your life. It's not something that somebody can step in and do for you. It's something he wants you to do. And many times, God is just waiting for you to step up and do what he's wanting you to do. Notice that Samuel said, <laughs> we're not going to sit down till he gets here. The Bible says, so Jesse sent for him and had him brought, to, brought in. He was ruddy and fine appearance, handsome in features. And then the Lord says, rise and anoint him. He is the one. Now, does anybody know what's missing out of this passage? We read about Eliab. We read about Abinadad. We read about Shammah. And matter of fact, several sons that were never named. But here is, Je here is David. One who stands large on the, pa on the page of Scripture. As a matter of fact, when you read the book of Revelation, you even read about David in the book of Revelation. And yet here, <laughs> he's not even named. Samuel was so impressed, impressed with Eliab, he thought, surely this is the one. Samuel was not even impressed enough with David to bring him to the sacrifice. We're all impressed with David, but up to this point in the scripture, he hasn't even been named. He's the man without a name. And yet God says, rise and anoint him. He is the one. There are some of you here today and you feel overlooked. You think sometimes, well, the world has forgotten me. Well, I want to tell you that God's not forgotten you. You haven't been overlooked by God. There is something he wants you to do. Now, it may not be nothing major. It may, die, may not be something that's going to impress a lot of people. But whatever it is, God wants you to rise up and do and be whatever God wants you to do. Whatever it is, God wants you to be. God is waiting on you to rise up. He will anoint you. He will use you. And by the way, it's not about you at all. It's what God is wanting to do in your life. David is the king that impresses us. I mean, we hold him in high regard. But in this story, his name is not even mentioned until a little bit later in the story. We've read this story so many times. We know it's David. We know all about him. But the writer of scripture doesn't even mention his name up to this point. Some of you feel like the world has forgotten you. The world hasn't noticed you. They're not even paying attention to me. Who am I that I can do great things for God? Well, it's not about you doing great things for God. It's about you being used where God can do great things through you. Now, David has not always been that mighty and high esteemed God. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, we read about David and find that he was not always the most popular person among the crowd. The Bible says whatever Saul asked David to do, David did it successfully. Now, the word successfully there is a very interesting word. What it means is that David put his heart into it. David did whatever Saul asked him to do, and he did it with all of his heart. So impressed Sam, uh, Saul that Saul made him a commander in his army, an appointment that was applauded by the fighting men and officers alike. But then something happened. Would you say something happened? Some of you got that story too, hadn't you? I mean, you were on your way up. You thought, man, 
I'm moving up good. Everything is falling right into place. And then something happened. Everything was going so well. All my plans were falling into place just like I planned them. And then something happened. There are many of us here this morning that sort of have the same testimony that David did. Everything was looking good. We'd gotten a promotion, but then something happened. Notice verse 6. Something happened when the victorious Israelite army was returning home after David had killed Goliath. Women came out from all of the towns along the way, and they were coming out to celebrate and to cheer Saul. But notice how the cheering went. They sang and they danced with joy, with tambourines and cymbals, and they sang this song, Saul has killed his thousands. And that's probably how the song went for a long, long time. Saul, a victorious warrior, Saul has killed his thousands. They'd come out and cheer, and they would just shout and carry on and praise Saul for the great victories he had won, and they were singing that song. But today they changed the chorus just a little bit. Instead of saying that Saul had killed his thousands, they added a new line and they said, David has killed his ten thousands. And when Saul heard this, it changed the way he felt. Now, everybody look right here for one second. You can impress people. That's easy. Our world is trying to tempt you always to impress somebody. With the way you dress, the cars you drive, the houses you build, there is something about you that the world is pleading with you. Try to impress someone. Try to impress someone. Folks, I want to tell you, when you impress somebody, <laughs> it's usually short-lived. They'll praise you for a minute or two, but then all of a sudden they forget all about that good stuff about you and really the only one you can trust that really counts is when you try to impress God if you try to impress people you'll find that people will disappoint you but if you try to impress God you'll find that God watches over you in the strangest of ways it's almost like magic we don't believe in magic around here we believe in the mighty hand of Almighty God. The Bible tells us in verse number 8, this made Saul very angry. What's this, he said? They credit David with 10,000, me with only 1,000. Next, they'll be making him their king. So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on him. Notice how this story unfolds. The very next day, it wasn't the next week. It wasn't the next month. It was the very next day. A tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul. He began to rave like a madman. David began to play his harp as he did whenever this happened. But Saul had a spear in his hand, and suddenly he hurled it at David, intending to pin him to the wall. But David jumped aside and escaped. Now, this happened again at another time, and I put the scripture reference there for you, 1 Samuel 19, verse number 10. But Samuel wasn't held in high, I mean, Saul, oh, shoot, David was not held in high esteem by everyone. Saul hated him and tried to make his life miserable. David really was one of the least of these. But notice how David used that in his life. 1 Samuel chapter 22, the Bible says that David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam, where his brothers and his fathers heard about it. They went down to, to see him there, and all of them who were in distress, in debt, and discontented gathered around him. And David became their leader, and there were about 400 with him. Now, folks, this is David the least of these caring for the least of these around him. Men in distress, men in debt, men who are discontented. And the Bible says 
this little ragtail bunch of folks gathered around David, and David turned them into a mighty army. This is what David's mighty army began like. Simply because David, one of the least of these, cared for the least of these around him. There's a, a girl that testified in the Global Leadership Conference this year. Her name is Tori Peterson. And she tells the story about how when she was growing up, uh, her mother was uh, taken away because she was into drugs. And for a long time, she was just passed from house to house in foster care. By the time she was 18 years old, she had lived in 12 distant, different foster uh, families. And uh, the title that went with her everywhere she went was that she was unadoptable. Nobody cared for her. Nobody wanted her. Until one day in high school track, her track coach just walked by her and said, you know, you can do great things. Well, she looked around because she thought, surely he's talking to somebody else. He couldn't be talking to me. But he really was talking to her. And that voice just kind of rang in her ears. Matter of fact, it made her a great track star. She became the state champion of the event she was running in. And because of that, she actually was given a, a track scholarship to go to school. Some school I can't remember the name of. But those simple words, you can do great things. Folks, I want to tell you, David, as one of the least of these, reached out and inspired the least of these. David, who was in debt. David took men who were distressed. David took men who were discontented. They were not happy with any part of life. And yet David took them. And he molded them into a mighty army. Do you know that you can have that same effect on somebody in your life? There may be somebody the world has kind of turned the lights out on. They'll never amount to nothing. There may be somebody that the world looks at them and said, oh, they're just the least of these. There's nothing they can do. Folks, I want to tell you, a kind word from you can make all the difference in the world. Just a, a word of encouragement might be the thing that turns their life around. David only needed one word of correction from God. There was a time where David wanted to help God. He wanted to build God a mighty temple. And so he made all the plans and he told the prophet, I'm going to build a temple from God. And the prophet was excited. He thought, man, that'll be great, God having a temple. Well, as the prophet was leaving, God spoke to him and said, no, nope, you go back to David and you remind David, tell him that I took him from following sheep, took him from the flock, and I put him out in front of the people of God. Folks, I want to tell you, I don't know what God wants to do in your life, but I know God can use you, and I know God will use you. But one of the things he may remind you of is, <laughs> don't forget where you were when I started working with you. For some of you, you've already started climbing the ladder of success. And God wants to simply remind you, hey, remember, I made you who you are. Just remember who you were and where you were when I started working in your life. I love this passage in Acts. It says that God removed Saul, but he was impressed with David. And the thing that impressed him with David is he found him to be a man after God's own heart. He did everything that God wanted him to do. My prayer for you this morning is that you will do everything God wants you to do, whatever it may be. It may be something big and grand. You may stand before thousands of people and give a speech or give a sermon or sing a song or something, 
or it may be something that nobody will ever know about. Just a word of encouragement to someone, a word of hope to someone. Folks, God wants to use you, and he has a plan for your life. I hope you'll rise and do what God wants you to do. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this time together this morning. And Lord, I just pray for each and every person that are, is in this building. And I pray that during this time of invitation, if there's some decision that you'd have us to make, I pray that you, we will honor you with our obedience. Today, Lord, I pray for each person that is here. And Lord, I ask that you'd speak to every heart. And Lord, if there's one here today that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that today might be the day they'd open their heart and receive what he has done for them. Forgiveness of sin, bringing them into the family of God. Father, I pray today they might trust him to be their Savior and their Lord. We pray these things now in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, whatever God may be speaking to you about this morning, I pray today you'll honor him with your obedience. And if there's some decision on your heart, whatever God would have you to do in this time of invitation, you come this morning. I'll meet you right down here at the front. Let's stand together as we sing. my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay Just so God, how I need Let's go back to that course one more time. 
understand with me, if you would. This is this is Gilbert, and he's getting a phone call. Yes, I gotta turn it off. Je Jesus called him in church. <laughs> this is Gilbert Garcia. He lives in Tucson, yes, and he wants to unite with our church uh, by statement. He is a member of Noah's Ark Church there in Tucson, but he wants to be a part of our church. What's yes. the pleasure of the church on receiving him? All in favor, would you give him a hearty praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Now, Gilbert is going to be leaving Tuesday to go back to Tucson, uh, but he wants to be a part of you group, uh, this group. So I know that you'll want to pray for him and encourage him in his work there. You work with children and uh, do all sorts of things, don't you? Yes, Bob. I work for the Gospel Rescue Mission, a homeless shelter. And we okay. have children, okay. families. All right. So I hope you'll welcome him into the, the fellowship of our church and let him know that you'll be praying for him. Uh, many of you know that about once a year he comes to be with us. He usually cooks for us. I didn't get none of his cooking this time. <laughs> but anyway, we're so glad to welcome him, and I know you'll want to come by and welcome him as we receive him into the fellowship of our church. Any word before we close? Just a thank you card from Miss Sue. She she broke her leg, and she just said, thank you, church, for the prayers and the food. She said, I truly do attend a great church. Hey, uh, one quick announcement before you guys can go. Actually, two. Um, Paige Williamson kind of told me this morning that I forgot to make an announcement in the video. Um, that and the bulletin. Is it September the 8th? 18th. We will have a walk through Bethlehem meeting September the 18th downstairs in the New Fellowship Hall at 4 p.m. Uh, make sure you're there. If you are any part, uh, any part at all of walk through Bethlehem, make sure you are there and be looking for that announcement next week because um, we're going to make sure we get that in there so she don't yell at me again. Um, other than that, Rodney Land also told me today that the there is new magazines and devotionals outside um, in the box out front. Um, there are two new ones of Journey and Stand Firm. Those are now quarterly magazines instead of monthly, so you can pick it up uh, once a quarter and um, let that speak to you. Um, other than that, let me pray, and then you guys will be dismissed. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for your son. Thank you for the gospel, the truth of it. Thank you so much that we're able to come to you with our burdens and um, with our, our, our victories and celebrate. And Father, use them to glorify you in everything we do. Father, I pray that we would be a church this week to share the gospel and to love people and to care for people. Um, and Father, I pray that you would take our members and those who are here with us this morning, Father, and as we go, that you would take us and give us rest and that you would bless us as we go. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. You guys are dismissed. <laughs>